At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the childlike. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Knowing me, knowing you. Aha! Sounds simple, right? Knowing things about the world is fairly easy. I just look. And I think a little bit about it. What's that noise? Take a look. Aha! It's the car coming up the driveway. How long does it take a cricket ball to fall into the river from the top of that tower over there? Check it out. Drop the ball. Time it. Aha! That long. What happened in Worcester during the final battle of the English Civil War? Check out the documents written at the time. Look at the archaeology. Ponder a little bit. Aha! And when it comes to things that are closer to home, such as myself, how could I go wrong? I know myself very well. Mm, uh, ish. It's not quite as simple as that. You don't have to be in the game of life for very long to realise that knowing the world can be a lot harder than I've suggested. There are countless ordinary situations in which we simply do not have access to the information we need to draw safe conclusions. Many in which we never could. And more than that, there are deep puzzles about everyday matters that philosophers have debated for thousands of years and are as divided over now as they ever were. Take something that we're all very familiar with. Consciousness. The show going on in your head. The colours, the sounds, the smells, sensations, tastes of everyday life. Our own thoughts, our own memories. What exactly is consciousness? And how does it relate to your brain? I suppose we wire you up to a scientific machine. We measure all the electrochemical events going on in your brain. And imagine that we ask you to um, smell the coffee. Mm. And as you smell it, you have that coffee smell sensation in your mind. Oh, and the taste. Suppose that every time you smell the coffee, a special cluster of neurons starts firing in your brain. What's the connection between the neurons firing and the smell sensation? Are they the same thing? Is that electrochemical event in the brain the sensation of smelling coffee? But that seems crazy. The smell sensation is a completely different kind of thing from a neuron firing. So is the neuron firing in your brain causing you to have the sensation? How does that work? We can see how physical events can cause physical events, like how energy can be transferred from a foot to a football when you kick it. But how does a physical event bring about an effect that is mental? I'm not going to go into this now, but let me assure you of one thing. Nobody understands it. And with all the science and philosophy that's gone into this area, and there's been a lot, we are still completely flummoxed. Consciousness is as everyday as you can get, yet it is profoundly mysterious. And even understanding yourself is a lot trickier than you might think. There's a lot below the surface that we're unaware of, which rises up from time to time, and we think, why did I... Say that. Why did I do that? Why do I feel this way? Why can't I stop doing this? We realise that we're often a mystery to ourselves, let alone other people. Knowing me. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tricky. And if knowing yourself is hard, knowing God is something else altogether. Because God is the creator. God's not part of the universe. God's not another item in the world like oranges or sheep or mountains. You can't make a list of all the things in the universe and then go, oh, that's not complete because I haven't put God on the list. God's not a thing. You can't go out and look at God or weigh God or measure God's side or size or speed or put God in a test tube. Knowing God is not like thinking of yourself and then imagining that it's he's like that but really nice and really big. No. God is not an infinitely inflated version of you. 
Theologians sometimes like to speak of God as holy other, or to use a fancier word, transcendent. God transcends, that is to say, God goes beyond the limits of creation. If knowing our world or ourselves is like trying to grab hold of a slippery bar of soap that, soap that keeps popping out of our hands, when <laughs> you know what it's like in the bath. Uh, well, what hope have we got of knowing God, the one who is the transcendent cause of the world? How can we possibly know God? There's a lot to say here, but I want to focus on the reading we just I just did from Matthew's Gospel, because it's got some important pointers. Jesus has been denouncing various towns in Galilee, towns in which he'd been performing miracles, yet the towns hadn't repented. In effect, they rejected his message of the kingdom. And then Matthew says, at that time, so he wants us to connect the words that we're about to read with the preceding story about people rejecting Jesus. So what's Jesus' response to the rejection of his message? He praises God. Weird. <laughs> I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Notice he doesn't think, oh, crumbs, that wasn't supposed to happen. Maybe God's not in control. No. God remains the Lord of heaven and earth. God has not let go of the steering wheel. So what's going on? Why has Jesus been rejected? Because, praised Jesus, God has hidden these things from the wise and the learned. The things that God has hidden are presumably the disclosures of the kingdom in Jesus' words and actions. The people heard his teaching and saw his miracles, but they couldn't understand their meaning. It didn't penetrate. A couple of chapters later, he makes a similar point to his disciples about the meaning of parables. This is from chapter 13. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. God hides the meaning of Jesus' teaching and miracles from people's minds, so that they look and look, but do not see. And notice whom God has hidden the truth from, the wise and learned, the people who think they already know all about God, people who think they can figure God out with their super-duper brain power. Figuring God out is not how we know God. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. That's a quote from Isaiah. And Paul goes on, Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So God hides the truth of himself, but not from everyone. Jesus continues, Father, you have revealed these to the childlike. The meaning of Jesus' words and deeds is unveiled to those who are like children, not to those who are childish, but those who are childlike, those who have an attitude of openness and receptivity and trust, those who are, in other words, teachable. This is not about intelligence, it's about a receptive heart. To the open-hearted, God reveals the meaning of Christ. Jesus often uses children to exemplify the kind of attitude that he's after among his disciples, Perhaps the most famous instance comes a few chapters later. This is chapter 18. At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Being childlike isn't some magic trick for knowing God. It's simply an attitude of knowing that we are utterly dependent on God if we're to know God. Knowing that we can't work our way up to God. If we're to know God, then God must come to us and disclose himself to us. We need divine revelation. 
or were lost. Those who realise this dependence are open to receiving revelation if and when it comes. Jesus goes on, Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. God has no interest in hiding himself from some people out of sheer perversity. He's not playing games. This is a very important point he's teaching us about how we can and how we can't know him. God's activity of hiding himself from some and revealing himself to others is making an important point about the nature of our relationship with the Creator. The hiding need not be forever, but for as long as we think we can access God for ourselves by our own cunning and native wit, he will remain hidden from us. It's only when we become like little children and realise that we're reliant on God to know God, that God will open up himself to us. Jesus then explains the theological foundations for understanding how we can know God. And this is important, so we ought to listen carefully to him. Who knows the transcendent God? No one has seen God. That's what John's Gospel says. Nobody knows God. Nobody, that is, apart from God. In eternity, God knows God. The Father and the Son know each other intimately. So Jesus goes on in our passage. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. This is the ultimate basis for our knowledge of God, namely God's knowledge of God's self. God alone is qualified to reveal God. And here is where we can speak of the incarnation, of God becoming a human being in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is God the Son as a human. He is God's word made flesh, God made visible in Jesus. The book of Hebrews puts this beautifully. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. The word of God with a capital W is not the Bible, it's Jesus himself. The Bible's the word of God because it bears witness to Jesus, but he is our focus, not a book. We value the book because it points us to him. He alone knows the Father and is thus able to reveal the Father. As John's Gospel tells us, Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing and he only says what he hears the Father saying. So to see him is to see the Father and to hear him is to hear the Father. Through Jesus, we come to understand what God is like. But not everyone does. Some people just see some wandering Galilean shaman, or a wonder worker, or a political troublemaker, or a false teacher. Some see his miracles and think, it's the work of the devil. Some hear his words and think, what a nutter. They look and they listen, but they do not see God. Because even as God reveals himself in Jesus, he simultaneously veils himself. The divine revelation is always mediated through creation, through the human words of a human prophet, or through the flesh and blood and words and actions of a human being named Jesus. Charles Wesley puts it beautifully in his Christmas carol, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. But to see the revelation of God in Jesus through that veil, we need divine assistance. It's God the Father who draws people to Jesus. He knows the Son and reveals his identity to those who are receptive. The most famous example of this is a few chapters later in Matthew. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? To the disciples. Simon Peter answers, you're the Messiah, Simon Peter. <laughs> I like that. Simon Peter answers, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, by my Father in heaven. It's God the Father that enables Peter to perceive, albeit in part, 
who Jesus is. The Father also enables us to discern the truth in Jesus, but not all in a flash of total understanding. In the case of Peter, he immediately goes on to misunderstand the nature of Jesus' messiahship. But that stumbling journey of discovery he was on was guided by God, and so it is with us. As we falteringly stumble towards truth, God holds our hands like a toddler learning to walk. For this knowledge of God is not principally about information kind of knowledge, information about God, though there is some of that. Knowing God is a relational thing. It's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. I know about Henry VIII. I know my wife. Knowing God is first and foremost about being in relationship with God, and like any relationship, it's a journey of discovery as we travel along the road. And as we open ourselves to the revelation of God in Jesus, Jesus discloses the Father to us. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, although this passage doesn't mention the Spirit, the rest of the Bible helps us to see the Spirit is essential to our knowing God. It's the Holy Spirit that the Father sends to work in our hearts so that we can grasp that Jesus isn't some godly geezer from Galilee, but God's own gracious gift of self-disclosure. It's the Spirit that works with us as we hear and respond to Jesus' words and actions and who helps us to perceive the Father in them. Our knowing God is the work of the Trinity. And just notice how God-centred revelation is. God isn't some inert object out there that I analyse. God is a subject who makes himself known. And who does the revealing? God. And what is revealed? God. And how does God reveal God's self? Through God. God reveals God through God. And we can walk the road of receiving this revelation of knowing God if we come with the open hearts of children and continue to walk in that same vein. Today you might feel like, I'm not a great theologian, I can't figure God out. Great! Well, take heart from the words of St Paul. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Think you're a fool or weak or insignificant? Sounds like just the qualifications you need to realise that you need God to know God. That is the beginning of wisdom.